First of all, I should, I should gain your permission, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like your permission this morning to ask you some questions and get you involved and, and even have a little fun with you here this morning. May I have your permission to do that? Okay, yes. A, a great way to respond, just enthusiastic like say, yes, Bob. Okay, that would be a great way to respond. I'll give you another opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your permission to ask you some questions and get you involved and even have a little fun with you here this morning? Yes, Bob. I knew you had it in you. Let's confirm then we are in the right place at the right time with the right people. And with that uh, little saying I, I like to start off with, it goes like this. I say, I'm in the right place. Let's all say that together. Here we go. I'm in the right place. Now, uh, the only time that I know that it's nice to point to in my meetings like this, point to the person next to you or across the road from you, and say to that person, you're in the right place. Let's do that. Here we go. You're in the right place. Okay, very good, very good. Now, one thing you'll learn about Bob this morning is I'll stretch this a little bit. You've got to make sure you put your coffee down. This is a very important part of stretching. Is you'll go like this now, all together, we'll go like this. We're in the right place. You see why the coffee has to go down? Okay, I'll give you a moment to do that. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. We're in the right place. We just needed a good morning stretch anyway. Truly believe we're in the right place at the right time with the right people. Our theme this morning is called Attitudes for Excellence. That is our theme here today. I learned a lot about attitude growing up, and it's a lifelong journey that I'm on. I'm eager to share some of the discoveries that I've made on my journey in life. I know there are probably a lot of discoveries that have been made in this room, and maybe we can uh, collect some of those even here yet this morning regarding our attitudes. I remember my first uh, uh, recollection of attitude that I really remember. Uh, I was very fortunate to have been raised on a farm in uh, uh, central Minnesota over here, uh, north of Alexandria. Anybody from the Alexandria area? North of Alec is a little town called Carlos. Dad was pretty well convinced that us boys should grow up on a farm and learn the principle of hard work. Anybody relate with the concept or the principle of hard work? I can remember Dad saying, any farm kids, any farm kids raised on a farm? Oh, a handful of people, very good. On the farm, Dad was uh, very focused <coughs> in the concept of teaching us boys the concept of hard work. Dad would, uh, as we were out, you know, cleaning the barns or throwing the hay bales, Dad would say, you work hard and you will eat good later in life, as he was referring to it. So we boys, we work like dogs. I mean, pitching the hay, pitching the manure, we were working like dogs. Mom, she would get in on the act, and we'd come in from the fields at noon, and she'd have a roasted chicken for each of us boys on the grill with a homemade loaf of bread for each of us boys, and a gallon of milk we'd suck down, and then we'd go back to work. And Dad would say, Work hard, and you'll eat good. You might have noticed I work pretty darn hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's something, Rick, you might want to consider. <laughs> As I left the farm, pursuing my career in life, I took this principle that Dad taught us, working hard, with me. It wasn't long I was out there in the real world, on my own, crashing and burning. I could not figure out why it was that I was working hard, but not having really any success in life. A good friend came to me and said, Bob, I notice you're working hard, but have you ever thought about working smart? I'd never heard of that concept before. And so I purposed in my life to find out what does it mean to work smart. And I'm eager to bring to you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, some of the discoveries I've made along my life's journey about what it means to work smart. So today I not only work hard, you might even notice I work up a little bit of a sweat. Here today, anybody here work up a sweat ever as you work hard? Yes, okay. A couple of us in the room raised their hands. And, uh, <laughs> And you'll discover as I move forward some of the, the uh, incredible discoveries I've made in working smart also. And I'll share those as we, 
as we press on here this morning. And, and with that in mind, I remember, I remember uh, this, because in the early years of growing up, it was very important for us to go to school and get an education, part of the concept of, of uh, you know, smartening up a little bit. And, and uh, I remember uh, uh, showing up on the playgrounds first thing as a little boy. I don't know what it is about kids, but kids can be pretty mean. I don't know if you remember this or not in your youth. I know I struggled with it quite a bit, show up on the playgrounds, and the kids would start making fun of me for some reason. I don't know, the curly red hair, the freckles, the big ears, I mean, they had a heyday with me. It was like chickens on the you know, chicken side, they didn't start picking at the, the weak link, you know, and they just peck up to that. And, and boy, I remember first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, man, it just didn't stop. And so, I, you know, they call it self-esteem today. Back then, they had no idea what it was, just kind of a dumb kid. I, got, I overheard a couple of teachers in the hallway talking about me. And they were having this big discussion about me. I know I heard my name. And one of them was, you know, what should we do? I don't know, what should we do? I don't know, what do you think we should do? And, and, and one teacher, I don't know what to do. And, and one teacher says, well, well, what about Bob? You know, what, what do we do about Bob? And now they made a movie out of this what about Bob thing. And, uh... <laughs> Oh, my. Well, I discovered real quick like that, you know, we have to fix ourselves from the inside. Teachers often have a tendency to try to fix us from the outside. And uh, as I started to do some repair in my life, I made some discoveries in life. In fact, I remember in ninth grade English, I failed that. Failed ninth grade English, didn't do very well. In fact, I could not see a purpose or a reason to learn all this grammar stuff. Uh, never dreaming years later that for a living I would be speaking for a living and writing for a living. Never dreamed that in a million years. And I failed and I failed and I failed. Speech class. Anybody remember speech class in high school? Wow, I hated speech class. You know, I swore in speech class. I swore I would never ever get in front of a group of people again. Don't do that. You might end up doing it for a living. Well, before long, I'm out in the real world and I get my very first job. And I remember I was on the job for about a week. I, I was pretty fortunate. I, I got a job working on a garbage truck. Woo! And I remember that after the first week on the job, I, I came into the office, and the boss calls me into the office. He, he, he gave me the finger, you know what I'm talking about, right? Calls me into the boss's office, and he sits me down on the chair, and he says, Buster, you got a bad attitude. I was a little shocked and surprised by that. I thought I had a pretty good attitude. And I said, I have a bad attitude. He says, yes, you're always grumbling, and you're complaining, and you're pouting and whining. He says, if you don't get your attitude adjusted, this might be your very last day here. He got my attention. That was my first uh, exposure to a little thing called fear motivation. So I said, well, what do I do? And he says, get it adjusted. I, I said, well, how do I do that? And he says, I don't know. <coughs> Just go do it. Well, right after that, I discovered happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't do anything but get me in a bunch of trouble. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life because that whack up alongside the head launched me on a journey, on a voyage of self-discovery, I purposed in my life to change my attitudes, and I started grabbing a hold of everything I'd get my hands on relating to the subject of attitude. And then when I learned something that made sense to me, I would adopt it into my life. I would take ownership for it. I'd take responsibility for it. And then, because each and every one of us are unique and special, I would begin to adapt that idea into my life, but most importantly, I would apply it when I heard something that seemed to be rather smart or a good idea. I'd say, hey, that's for me. I'm going to do that. And I applied that concept in my life. I'll give you an example of one of those things I discovered years ago, because I think this is a really smart idea. Years ago, I heard someone say to me, Bob, you need to have a plan. Well, after that point, I've been kind of used to flying by the seat of my pants or 
kind of wing it in life. And, and so I thought, well, you know, that kind of sounds like a smart idea. And uh, I heard this concept that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So that became some motivation for me. And I started planning because I didn't like failure. And as I started planning, well, let me just do a quick survey here today. How many of you have, and can honestly raise your hand, you have a written life strategy? You took all your goals in life, you wrote them down, you put them into a nice little three-ring binder, and you have a written life strategy for your life. Written strategy. Show of hands here in the room. How many people have a written life plan? couple of us. I see my daughter Ellie here, my executive assistant. Her hand went up, and I have mine. Anybody else? Okay. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. fail. Let me explain to you what I did immediately. I started planning every aspect of my life. If something was worth doing, it was worth a plan. I wanted to be in the right place at the right time with the right people talking about the right kinds of ideas. And so in business, it was very easy with my business plans and business strategies. But then I started looking into the personal side of my life. And as I did that, I started taking all of what people call your priorities. I thought this would be a really smart idea. I took all of my priorities and laid them out, one, two, three, four, five, all the way down. And so, I, because what would happen is I'd get a great idea and something would come along and get me off track. And I needed something to keep me on the straight and narrow, to keep me focused, going like down the highway of life. And so I got my ducks in a row, you might say. My priorities. And now I'm not saying my priorities have to be your priorities, but I decided in my life that one of the most effective things I could do was I looked at relationships. They're very important to me. And so I took all the relationships in my life. I took, for example, my number one relationship, my, my highest priority, my relationship with God. Very high priority. My second highest priority, my relationship with my wife. High priority. Third relationship, my role as a father, my job as a dad. I have written plans and written strategies because I want to be the best dad I can possibly be. There's a lot of absentee fathers in our world today, and I became very motivated to be a good dad. And then, of course, my business relationships, high priority. And then I just laid my priorities. And then I started taking each of these priorities and laying out written strategies and written plans in every aspect of my life. For example, my dear wife, Vicki, and I, married 33 years now. How many married people? Show of hands here. Married people. How many of you have a written plan for your marriage? How many married people have a written strategy, a written plan for your marriage? Anybody? Day by day. <laughs> All down in black and white. Now you've got to understand what triggered this one, okay? Because there are what are called trigger points in life. And, and what triggered this strategy uh, and written strategy life. I remember this as clear as a bell. It was, uh, gosh, like about a week after the honeymoon. We were settling into our routines in life. She had her job, I had mine. I remember this day as clear as a bell. I walked, in, well, she was home from her job before I. I walked in the house, I find my bride, she's on the couch, and she's crying. Right off the bat, I'm thinking, something's the matter here. <laughs> so I start to ask the question, honey, what's the matter? Nothing, just leave me alone, she responded. I'm thinking, why are you crying? Maybe something, did something happen at work today, I asked? And she said, no, just leave me alone. I'm very confused at this point. I begin to think, maybe, maybe I've done something wrong. Honey, have I done something wrong? It was like thunder and lightning and sparks. And she slams her hand on the table and she goes, you never do the dishes. 